So I'll let uh, our panelists introduce themselves first. Uh, who's going to start? <laughs> OK, I think there's uh, stuff with me. So uh, my name is Kerry. I'm uh, from Portagon FinTech Group. So basically, Portagon is uh, we have uh, two main you know, focus. One is that traditionally we are the uh, Forex uh, tech provider. So we are providing all the you know, Forex uh, related trading platform, all the tech stuff, and also for liquidity. The other focus will be the blockchain and cryptos. So basically, we venture into the uh, crypto market in 2017. So basically, we did all, or almost everything related to cryptos, like ICO, provide you know, like, um, the trading platforms to, to crypto exchange, you know, like fundraising, almost everything. So basically, here today is to share everyone some of the, you know, like the ideas and some of the new things. So I think that it will be beneficial to everyone over here. Jasper? Um, hello everyone, I'm Jasper, uh, Managing Director of eToro. eToro is actually uh, one of the largest social trading network in the world. We have uh, over 10 million users right now. Uh, we offer multiple assets class, including like uh, stock, FX, ETF, uh, including crypto. So uh, in terms of crypto authoring, we are actually having a really good two years uh, in the past 2017-2018. Uh, uh, we are neither an exchange authoring in crypto nor a purely OTC market. So we are offering a very interesting model, which is we can share today, uh, which is uh, very relevant to the topic as well. Phil? Hi, so my name is uh, Philip Gillespie. I represent uh, B2C2. Uh, we are primarily a, a liquidity provider and also an exchange market maker. Um, what we do and what, where we uh, focus on is we provide liquidity to financial institutions that are primarily coming from existing uh, FX trading broker background. Um, and what we aim to do is to provide the service and the liquidity that FX providers are used to in the crypto space. Um, we primarily focus on spot and CFDs, and um, you know, we're, we're located in Europe and in Asia in Tokyo. Uh, hello, I'm Tom. I'm CEO and founder of Goldeye. Um, we are a software development company based in the UK with offices in Shanghai and now in Sydney. Um, we develop software around the FX CFD and now uh, crypto space. Um, and uh, a couple of years ago, we launched our first crypto product called CryptoSwitch, which is a liquidity aggregation platform around, uh, around cryptos for CFD um, and also the cash products. And that's, uh, that's going quite well now, but it's, uh, it's interesting to see the way that that's changed over the last year. And we're going to talk a lot more about that on the panel. Hi, I'm uh, Wayne Trench, CEO of OSL. Uh, OSL is one of three uh, subsidiaries of a Hong Kong main board listed company, BC Group. Um, OSL is uh, Asia's leading digital asset brokerage, so we are all about customers uh, and providing um, products and services uh, in the digital asset space um, to, uh, to allow customers to express a view. Okay, so um, this year has been indeed a challenging one, but um, um, what, what have you been investing in uh, during the past year? And how are you building the infrastructure for, for the crypto space? Who wants to start? I'll start if you like. So we've, we've been, um, uh, it's about, about a year ago, we started looking at where we thought the, our traditional customer base, which is the FX and CFD well, where they would be um, taking advantage of the crypto space. And um, we thought that wasn't in the cash products, that was in the CFD space because of the le leverage that they needed and the ability to short. So we worked with a, a number of different market makers and built our, our cleared uh, CFD crypto system. Um, and we've been taking that to the FX and CFD brokers uh, around the world. Now, in the last year, that's definitely changed. Their appetite a year ago um, was immense. And I think every other person coming to our booth at the show here last year was talking about cryptos. Um, it's different. There are two worlds. There's the crypto world with different liquidity providers, different brokers, different exchanges, and the FX and CFD world. And the two were coming together closer. I think they're now further apart. And I think it'll take a little while before they come back together again. And we see that as one of our core jobs is to bring those two back together again, because they should be together. They just aren't at the moment. Wait, wait. Yeah, sure. So I think um, in our view, uh, uh, last year was obviously a, a tough year from a price action perspective. Um, but I think this year for us, we really see uh, 2019 as being the year of institutionalization. And uh, a lot of firms around the world, uh, including uh, us, 
uh, who are really invested and believe in the longer term digitization or tokenization movement are investing more than ever in institutional grade infrastructure uh, that will really underpin the ecosystem going forward. So we've spent a lot of time, a lot of money on, uh, on things like, let's say, in our, uh, our white label business, um, producing software that we can white label to customers that is auditable and uh, that is robust and that complies with regulation. And uh, we, th we feel that's important. And we, I think we recently announced that uh, uh, we've taken on uh, PwC as, as our auditor, so as the first listed digital asset business globally with a big four auditor, was a real milestone for us. And I think is a sign of where the industry is heading. Um, I think custody is another big one. Um, and uh, for us, uh, you know, we, we've spent a lot of time, a lot of money again, investing in, in custody because much beyond just Bitcoin, uh, if we are really to digitize or tokenize uh, assets more broadly and, and unlock liquidity in, in traditionally illiquid assets, it all boils down to those assets being safeguarded and stored safely and securely, regardless of whether it's Bitcoin or the $200 trillion in real estate, whatever it might be. Um, and, you know, insurance is a big part of that. So, you know, announced, announced insurance coverage. Uh, that, that to me is a big uh, thing for the industry overall is really institutionalizing the infrastructure so that the larger institutional players can participate. Phil, do you agree? Um, well, yeah, sure. And uh, I can kind of talk about what, where we focus on. So being a primarily electronic uh, liquidity provider, last year, you know, we're one of the first uh, liquidity providers that, you know, focused on fixed um, provision from a market maker perspective. And we also delivered CFDs because, you know, we have a lot of large FX client base in Tokyo that were, you know, requesting CFTs. One thing that I can add is that where we focused on isn't just the infrastructure. CFT is quite interesting in the crypto space. I mean, where is the funding rate? Uh, a lot of brokers are just charging, uh, you know, negative funding regardless of long short positions. But we try to actually, as financial professionals, come up with the real implied market rate. And we can actually drive this. We, we look at the dollar funding, the yen funding, which is obviously drive through. We look at the futures and we look at the implied funding rate. And we offer a, a positive uh, funding rate on our CFD products as well. And, you know, especially me being based in Tokyo and speaking to the Japanese clients, they're quite surprised that the, the actual funding rate in crypto is a lot larger than FX. And they said, this is great. Because as you guys all know from coming from FX, carry is a major component in, in you know, marketing uh, spot FX products. Um, but little do people realize that you know, we're offering you know, double digit funding on crypto positions, on CFDs. And this is really appealing. And one of the things that we want to do now is that we feel comfortable because we wrote this out, we know it works, and we like to try to make sure that everybody understands and you know, trade these products. <clears throat> so yeah, like uh, in Etoro, unlike a lot of FX broker, they start their interest in uh, crypto CFD by late 2017. We actually offered Bitcoin trading four years ago. And the way we do it is actually quite different. We actually custodian clients uh, physical crypto. Uh, so in the 2018, we actually spent a lot of time, you know, developing our own wallet. So right now, like when clients trade their Bitcoin on Etoro, they can actually withdraw their Bitcoin to the Etoro wallet, right? So uh, in 2018, we also able to acquire the uh, license. So we have license right now in Gibraltar. And uh, we are also expand our crypto offering to uh, US, which is require a lot of regulations. Uh, 2019, um, actually, uh, everybody can looking forward to our crypto exchange, which is going to be very focused on the tokenizing asset. So uh, very high chance we are offering a lot of uh, different stable coin and also different financial assets class is going to be on this new eToro exchange. Yeah, um, so I think that in 2018 was a, it's a very challenging year for us. Basically, is that we have seen that basically we went through the whole, you know, like the, the industry cycles within the year itself. So uh, for us, Portagon, basically we are traditional, you know, like the, the Forex liquidity provider and also for the tech providers. Then on 2000, uh, late 2017, actually we ventured into the crypto industry. Basically is that, you know, we help, you know, to set up uh, some of the crypto exchange. So one of them is like basically is a, a Jupota, uh blockchain exchange. So uh, we also help them to actually raise the, the first round of the ICOs. So basically we help them to raise about 27 million just in nine seconds. Then from there we see that hey, you know, like 
I think that the ICO market is good. Then we also venture into ICO. We set up our own ICO, you know, like uh, advisory teams. And also, we also build the blockchains, you know, technologies. Uh, like some of the clients, they, they, they want to develop into the, um, the protocols and the, the apps. We also help them to do it. But however, at the middle of the year, we see that the, actually the crypto market actually crashing, start to crash. So what we have seen is that the physical token, right, the, the, the market actually is not going to sustain because a lot of people, you know, the ICOs is not doing well. A lot of people are being stuck. Then we, then we think of it, hey, wait a second, we come back to the crypto CFD. Because basically, in the whole crypto market, the people they are going to trade, you know, like for the crypto, uh, crypto doesn't necessarily to hold the physical token itself. So that's why uh, now we are moving towards of the, the direction of like providing the crypto liquidities because traditionally we are the, the FX liquidity program. We can actually effectively to provide the crypto CFD as one of our product offering. And that's why we are uh, recently we launched a, a new system called Lexus. Basically, it's a, it's a liquidity, you know, like um, the, the, the solution. But one of the value propositions that we are actually facing to our brokers and the clients is that, you know, like taking our liquidity, you don't need to worry about the counterparty risk. Because a lot of the, the, the liquidity provider nowadays in the market is that, hey, I'm really making a, making a market itself. So what if one day I'm going to go bust if the, the, the whole market is going to the same directions? So with Lexus, we are effectively, uh, you know, like to diversifying our risk towards of the exchange to hash a delta. So I think that that, that is a direction that we are working towards. And we are thinking that for the next two, three years, we will be a good market for the crypto CFD industry. So um, CFDs have been banned in Europe and they're uh, also in the US. Uh, it's a strictly localized product. Uh, where do you see the future of the crypto OTC market uh, between CFDs and trading crypto on the OTC? Well, I think the regulators, um, they get a bit scared by something new. I mean, generally, they, it takes quite a long time for them to get up to speed on things. Um, and so um, banning a, a CFD on, on a crypto seemed like a bit of a strange move because with a leverage control on it of quite low, say, you know, two or three, um, and the volatility we're seeing at the moment, it, it's not that a risky product at all. Um, there's miners with high risk and high leverage in that. So. Um, I would hope that that would um, that would get relaxed and that would be it would be acceptable to trade those again because it is the right product. If you if you're a retail trader and you want something with a price that's going to move, um, CFD is the right product for you. Wayne, what do you think? Um, so I think the uh, the the CFD or the swap market that we we would want to operate in is a little bit different to everybody um, here in in terms of systematic market making CFD on an FX style basis. Um, I guess the the, the swap products that we talk about are probably more akin to the traditional swap business in equity land where uh, if we feel uh, like, you know, again, this movement is broader than, uh, than just about Bitcoin or it, it's about tokenizing uh, securities or real estate or, or even Bitcoin for what, for what it's worth, um, you know, we can really tailor um, products for spe specific funds or customers um, and provide them synthetic access over swap. Um, that's the CFD market that we're probably closer to operating in and that we're operating in. Um, so a little bit different to, I think, what we're talking about here. Uh, Phil? Yeah, I mean, it really depends on the market and, and it's, it's a very convoluted market. Um, you know, like, like uh, Japan is a very large market for spot effects. Retail spot effects is huge. Um, the Japanese brokers want to offer CFDs in Japan, but um, again, the regulatory complexity in e each of these markets is, is, is quite different. Like in Japan, you cannot offer CFDs unless you have spot. So there's no way of kind of saying, okay, let's just only do CFDs. They need to do spot in order to do CFDs. That's just the rule that the FSA enforced. Um, again, it's, it's constantly changing and you know, these, these rules might, 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 might change, but it's, as for now, um, nobody really sees it as, as kind of two different things. It's, it's you know, one kind of um, uh, company is the other. Um, and in regards to CFDs, um, obviously, as a, from a broker perspective, um, I think that it feels a lot more like FX. A lot of brokers want to come into the crypto space, but the custody piece, um, you know, the understanding how crypto works, uh, it just, uh, you know, for a lot of guys, and I sympathize, you know, it's, it's, CFDs feel a lot more like FX. And that's why there's this constant demand uh, from the broker side to push the product. But, you know, in my mind, you know, it's, it's, the spot's always going to be there. And it's, it's, a, it's a comprehensive, you know, 
um, the two market will always exist, and um, you know we just have to see how uh, it, it evolves. I guess um, there's a um, in the traditional world of um, equities trading and futures trading, you've always had uh, a derivatives market that has followed on from a spot market or from cash market, and the derivatives market often gets considerably larger than the than the first market, the primary market. Um, and I think we're, we're probably talking about those two things here, where we've got the, the digitization of assets, which is you're talking about, which is the primary market, and then the derivatives market is, is, hasn't really come along properly yet, and it will come along, and it will grow on top of that, and, it, and I think it will grow considerably larger, as in traditional markets have. I actually quite agree with Phil that, you know, like, uh, I think it's a matter of choice, right? So we have uh, a lot of ethics brokers that actually work good at authoring leverage ethics, um, so they mo probably more prefer to do the CFD. Uh, but what we Etor actually do is like uh, we do the uh, OTC, right? So uh, it's actually very difficult for the ethics broker to come into this field because it's the uh, technology. Like for example, if you want to offer right now uh, CFD for uh, leverage for the uh, 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 Neo or, or other blockchain, right? So the custodian is very difficult for for the technology wise uh, the ethics broker uh, to open it up. So I think there's still an entry barrier for the ethics brokers to go for that side. And it's actually good for like, we have some liquidity provider here to offer the CFD authoring to the ethics broker. Uh, but I do think like, uh, if we are really want to go to the blockchain side, uh, to open up a lot more this kind of uh, infrastructure within the company is the way in. It's not like, uh, like getting the CFD is not really get into the blockchain industry. Yeah, so I think that um, they are totally to agree with you. Because I think that for the CFD, um, this product can work really well with the spot market. Basically, is that like when we are talking to a lot of clients, basically that uh, like I, for for the broker, it's one segment of the client uh, client that would like to expand their product product offering. However, when we are talking to the exchange, actually they also need to have the the CFDs because basically they are holding the crypto uh, crypto physical crypto itself. They need to have you know like the the CFD product to do the hatching. So I think that you know, like from that pr perspective, I think that it's like the CFD this product actually fits to you know like majority of the the, the, the different segments. So one of the the issues with uh, physical uh, crypto is uh, is security, and uh, what do you think that the industry needs to do in order to to tackle this issue and get the customers and the regulators approval for uh, growing the industry? I'll start. Okay. Um, I think at, at this point in time, there's, there's no uh, silver bullet with respect to a product that just delivers perfect security for tokens or, or Bitcoin or whatever. Um, so uh, we, from our perspective, it's really a system which requires the very best technology that's available, but also the, the processes and the people and the segregation of duties and um, uh, it's operational process together with technology that, that can deliver a, a, robust techno a robust security or custody solution. Um, and the insurers uh, around the world are slowly coming to terms with uh, um, you know, the technology that's available and they're wrapping their heads around it and are now starting to issue uh, insurance coverage. It's not cheap, uh, certainly with respect to traditional custodian in in insurance. It's uh, it's not cheap, but they are now offering it. And uh, you know, it, when we were talking to insurers 12 months ago, it was a very different story to what it is now. Um, so I think security uh, is evolving, it's improving every day, but it's not just a technology solution, it's a process in, in my view. I think this, the, um, most of the people at this conference shouldn't have to worry about this. I mean, you don't, they don't worry about having to keep gold in lumps of gold somewhere if someone's trading a, a gold product on a, a future or a CFD. Um, and they, don't, they shouldn't have to worry about that for the, the, the secondary market that they're going to be trading here. So I, I, think, I do think there really are two separate worlds, the primary and the secondary market. And the brokers that we work with, um, they, they, re they really don't want to, to, to have wallets. They don't want to store things because that's, that's taken care of by the primary market. And it's just not their space. They don't, they don't understand that. They don't need to understand that. So um, I think the two, that you would need really good security for the primary market, as you, you've been describing, um, because anything that's of high value and is easy, is easy to, to hack, will, some will find a way of doing it. But the secondary market is different. And I don't, you know, that should just be in fiat currency trading these, these um, as, you, as you're trading an index or a, um, FX or a CFD or anything. 
I think the mm -hmm. way to improve the security in the crypto uh, world, like uh, is actually to get a lot more professional players to come into this area. Like the reason why we keep thinking like the the crypto exchange is very vulnerable because a lot of the hacking, right? It's just because a lot of uh, not so professional player in this market, uh, because this market is growing super fast. That's that's why a lot of people are coming in, but that that the whole infrastructure is actually not ready. They don't even like do the daily reconcile of uh, you know the assets they're holding right now. Uh, a lot of hacker come in. They actually the hacker come in at day one when you start your exchange, and they will only do the hacking once you have a lot of clients, right? So I think the, the current bearish market is actually very good timing to kick out a lot of bad player. And then uh, to once like the regulations, like uh, the infrastructure is ready, like the professional player is coming in, I think like the security already improved like uh, significantly, right? But the next is just like uh, what Wayne was saying, like this is nothing is uh, bulletproof, right? So it's taking time that you know, uh, it's, a, it's an ongoing process to improve the security, I would say. Phil, just uh, uh, yeah. yeah, one more thing to add, I think, on top of this, because I completely agree, you know, exchanges are becoming better and there's more responsibility, there's more you know, technology coming in and whatnot, but the other thing that I always found funny was that you know, crypto was supposed to be a, an asset where you, know, you hold on to it, you, you have it in your wallet. It wasn't supposed to be something that you just leave on exchange because it wasn't really the exchange's responsibility to provide custody. And, Sure, now that's changing and that's part, that's a, an evolution, but I, I kind of wonder, you know, and I always stress this with, especially when I'm speaking to traditional FX brokers, because we need to inform the, the end users of what this product is. It's a very unique product, and one of the selling points was that you hold the custody, you, and that, that was the whole uh, purpose of the asset. So I think, you know, technology, sure, the evolution, sure, Trust banks might get involved, insurance might be there for deposit insurance and whatnot, but we do need to also, um, in order for this market to grow, we need people to understand what they're dealing with. And that's, you know, we should see less of a problem um, as people understand how to actually uh, use and trade cryptos. It's kind of funny, right? They say uh, the best part about this asset class is you can hold on to the assets yourself. The worst part about this asset class is you hold on to it yourself. <laughs> And actually, I think this leads to another topic that I was in another panel the other day when I was in another conference, right? It's uh, talking about the centralized exchange and decentralized exchange, I was going to ask right? about that, yeah. So, so uh, yeah, you're right. Like, uh, for the crypto assets, you can actually hold the assets yourself in your wallet, right? But the thing is, like, nowadays in a lot of exchange, uh, it's centralized exchange, right? That the exchange itself still custody uh, the client's uh, crypto asset. While the decentralized exchange is still not mature enough to offer the same infrastructure, infrastructure the trading experience uh, for the clients uh, nowadays. So I think in the future, yes, like uh, the clients can actually hold their crypto asset. It's safer, it's decentralized, but um, it's not there yet, I would say. Yeah, so, so uh, yeah, I totally agree. I think that when we talk about the regulations, like they, they basically break into like different, you know, like stages on, on the cryptos, right? Like the initial market, like for example, the ICOs, now we can see that it's moving towards uh, the, uh, the STOs because like the token used to be a security uh, utility, now it's moving towards the security, that's one part. The other part is about the, the physical crypto exchange regulations. Which, which uh, I'm seeing that a lot of like the, the countries are come up, coming up with the license like the, the, the especially for the Southeast Asia, like the, um, um, Thailand, Malaysia, they are coming up with, with, with the, the, the regulations. But for the, for the crypto CFD space, I think that is now we are still going back to the Forex regulation itself. So I think that when we are talking about the regulations, basically the fundamentals are quite different over here. So um, how much the price impact has uh, affected brokers in uh, their appetite to offer crypto products? And uh, do you s what do you see? Uh, you mentioned obviously the institutionalization of the industry, but uh, um, when is it going to happen? Everybody's waiting for it. The, uh, I mean, if you look at the traditional brokers that we were with, we've got about 150 um, FX CFT broker clients around the world, and the, it's an enormous impact. Um, the, the reduction in volatility and the fact that the price isn't just shooting up means that the clients weren't running to them 
for this product. Therefore, the brokers have lost appetite to offer this a, a lot. I mean, we've seen a, bit, a big reduction. Yet. They're not saying they don't want to do it. It's just not top of their list. It's not the discussion on their board, board every time like it was before. Why aren't you doing cryptos? Um, it's another asset class that they're talking about. I think, I think crypto as a CFD is just a matter of a product, right? It's not different than like I offer one more currency pair. It's just a matter of priority, right? So right now, obviously, the, the price is like uh, deeply going down. It's a bearish market right now. So it might not be go to the uh, priority for the R&D pipeline. But I'm sure like uh, all the FX broker eventually would love to offer it. It's just a matter of time, right? Uh, I think the most problem right now is uh, the retail clients lost their appetite to trade crypto. Um, so this is uh, like we see significantly going down of our clients to trade crypto. But good thing is like uh, our clients start to trade like uh, stocks uh, in our platform. So it's okay. Yeah. Uh, over here, I would like to share one of the interesting report I've seen last week, basically with a uh, broken notes. You were saying that like for in 2018, basically there's over 40 million of online traders. So among these online traders, actually surprisingly to see 60% actually are trading cryptocurrencies and only about 22% are actually trading FX. So from that perspective, from the bro uh, broker point of view, we can see that what is a potential market, actually if they are going to offer the crypto CFD product, it can actually capture a very significant of market share to, uh, on, on, on top of their client uh, base over here. Yeah, yeah and one more thing to add is that I think when the prices rise, you know, in, you know, in 2017, the guys who are not convinced about crypto say, oh my God, this is a bubble market, and they stay away. When the prices fall, the guys who are not convinced with crypto say, hey, this, I'm, not, I'm gonna stay away. So I think there's two camps, the guys who are convinced in crypto and the guys who are not. Um, in terms of the guys who are convinced, there, there are a lot of uh, kind of background stories. Uh, you know, for, for some, it could be that, you know, uh, leverage restrictions that are coming in in FX and they need to diversify uh, product offering, um, whatever the case is. But to answer your question, when prices fall, I don't think that, you know, automatically people just say, okay, it, it, it's over. I mean, a lot of guys are on the sideline uh, who are, um, you know, willing to come in. Again, to provide a slightly different perspective, um, you know, definitely look out for Japan this year because last year, the whole entire year, no new brokers were able to come in because the regulators said no more. And now, you know, we just had the, the headline that CoinCheck, the exchange that started this whole, uh, you know, restriction in Japan, got a license. So, and there are 150, you know, large firms waiting to get a license. And, you know, these guys, you know, they're not pulling out because the prices collapse. And it's definitely collapsed from a year ago. But these guys are coming in and they're convinced. So, the demand is there. And it's just, um, you know, kind of identifying uh, where they are and uh, who they are. So. Yeah, I think um, like, uh, the the price action that we've that we saw towards the end of 2017, right? The the euphoria, as if you will, was was great in that it um, it wrestled crypto into mainstream conversations. Like all of a sudden, it became front and center and forced people to stand up, look at it, take a view. Without that speculative bubble activity, we probably some many people wouldn't be sitting in the room today, right? Because it, it really brought it into the public domain. And I think uh, as the, the, the price has, has come off and, and the, uh, maybe the speculative behavior has waned, um, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's still, there's still many participants in the marketplace who believe in the bigger picture and uh, continue to invest. And I think, you know, for uh, the, uh, Dave uh, Chapman, one of our executive directors who's been in this space a lot longer than me, would say this is the first, he's seen five or six of these crashes before, 80, 85% moves. But it's the first time where the rate of investment at an institutional level has, con has continued. Um, so I don't, know, uh, I don't know how that bodes, but I think um, it, it is different uh, this time around. If we look back at the original title of the panel, you know, lessons learned from what's happened. Um, when everything was shooting up a year and a half ago, um, the professional, the quality of the exchanges was very poor. We were asked to integrate um, with price feed, not for trading, just for, for B-booking pricing. And we, we integrated with one exchange, and then that wasn't reliable enough, so we did two. We ended up having to do six to be able to get a consistent price continuously, which is extraordinary. You'd never have to do, you shouldn't have to do that. And the quality has now, is now improving enormously in the move to institutional grade 
um, exchange, the technology they're using, um, you know, like with B2C2, is, is extraordinary. It's so much better than it was because the, the scalability of this sort of web-based exchanges that were built were just, just not there. They, they would scale to two or three times normal capacity, which you need to be able to scale to 100 times capacity in a, in a peak activity like we do in FX CFDs. So it it's really has cleaned things out and given a much more professional um, market for the, for the exchange side of it. So eventually when uh, activity comes back to the market, uh, this will make uh, the product more attractive. Um, so um, Phil, um, will you enlighten us on uh, a bit of more macro perspective? I know that you have uh, an investment banking uh, background and you can probably tell us what could be the trigger from a macro point of view uh, of the next bull cycle. So this is going to kind of go into my own personal opinion, but uh, I mean, crypto is interesting. I mean, it was, uh, you know, born in the midst of a financial crisis, right smack in the Lehman, you know, post Lehman, uh, you know, 2009, right? Um, one thing is there's a lot of hype in the market, uh, like we were saying earlier, you know, 2017, huge bull run, CMEs offering crypto, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, the professionalization of the, the industry and stuff. So. The, the fundamentals are getting better and, and you know, kind of the, the groundwork's uh, kind of coming in, but um, like CME coming in didn't really change too much, you know, or and there's a few things, a few other announcements that we're going to see later this year, maybe ETFs, different kind of stuff, but fundamentally, what does this asset class represent? And I think eventually you're going to have to have uh, kind of a macro convergence. Um, I'm not a doom and gloom, gloom kind of guy and I don't want to speculate anything, but you know, when right now we're, we're moving from QE to QT, as we, we often hear, you know, the U.S. is tightening. Uh, we had a little blip last year with Turkey. You know, anybody who trades uh, FX knows that, you know, dollar try just skyrocketed, right? Turkish lira collapsed. Now we're starting to see headlines, um, you know, between uh, the U.S. and China, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, do I think that this is going to be a, 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 you know, massive uh, catastrophe this year? No, I don't. But you know, eventually something has to tie in to the crypto. Crypto has to tie into the macro world. It can't just be this uh, tech asset class that's, that's, you know, completely irrelevant from everything else that's going on. Um, and with that aspect, I, I think one of the key thing is when there is another uh, EM crisis, when deleveraging really kind of spirals out of control, you know, will people go in and, and buy crypto? Uh, we don't know the answer to that to yet, but I mean, that, that's going to be the real test. And it's not going to be about, you know, another exchange or another whatever. I mean, you know, it has to converge, right? So. Wayne? Yeah, I share your view, mate. Um, I think we have had some little uh, data points along the way, though, in Turkey and in Venezuela and in Zimbabwe and whatnot that, that would point to uh, adoption rates uh, or at least activity levels being significantly higher when you do get these periods of economic unrest or dislocation. Um, you know, if, if we get a major unwind, uh, you know, macro picture is looking pretty sour at, at the minute. If we get a major economic unwind, I'm not, not sure it will be quite so widespread, but the, you know, the concentrated pockets in, that we've seen would le lead me to believe that there's some appetite um, for crypto in, uh, when governments have got it wrong. Okay. Um, so next, uh, let's uh, focus a bit on... Uh, the, the, um, the launch of uh, physical futures. Uh, do you think that is going to have a different impact on the market uh, when compared to the um, set, set of uh, um, cash settled futures? Well, um, I think that it all depends on what is the, the, uh, the base currency that we are talking about over here. So when we are talking about the physical settles cryptos, so if the, the, the base currency that is going to invest in the, in, in, uh, in the crypto future country itself is a crypto again, then basically I don't see that there's any difference. Because like basically for traditional futures, it's like, like you're, you're using US dollar to, you know, like, like for example, pork, you know, cotton, like that kind of the commodities. But so that's why, um, yeah, again, it all, all depends on what is the, 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 the currency or the fiat or the crypto that is going to invest into this future itself. So if like, we are talking about the, 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 the fiat currency, USD, then at the end of the day, you are going to have the physical future, uh, the crypto delivery. Yes, that makes sense, right? But if you still like you are investing in BTC, 
right, for the, for, for this uh, future contract, but at the end of the day, you'll get the PDC for delivery. This seems like it's a li little bit redundant. Yeah. Oh, I think we need, no? the, we need the clearers um, to be able to clear the product, because when the, um, the futures first launched on the, CBA, the CME and the CBOE, um, we got really excited about that, and then when our um, broker clients tried to find clearers, they couldn't find any clearers. So whilst the product was there, they couldn't actually use it, and they, could, they wouldn't clear it because it was, to a bank, it was just a confusing product. They didn't understand how to regulate it, how, to, how it was priced, they didn't understand anything about it, so it was too foreign for them. Once you can get these, these clearers to actually clear it, then that will, it will um, unblock the whole system, and then I think you will see trading in the futures working. Jasper? Oh. I just want to clarify, like uh, when you ask uh, the physical uh, futures settlement, right? Are we talking about the recent announcement coming from Berk, like they are going to do uh, this like uh, crypto uh, settlement, right? So it's, is that right, right? So it, I, I think like uh, uh, in that sense, it's actually quite psychologically positive. Like uh, the recent, uh, uh, you know, go down of the crypto price is is actually. Uh, like people are expecting the institutional payer to come in, right? In the past two years, the price go up is actually mainly because of retail, right? A lot of people are expecting the institutional player will come in to actually, you know, pump that up again. Um, I think that the announcement on this is actually bring a lot more uh, psychological effect that people think, you know, like the institutional at least is uh, having their interest on this market and that will bring, you know, the buying power again back to this market, uh, more more than you know the exact effect that this uh, contract will bring to the market. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean we, we're we're pretty conservative. I mean I think that the bigger news is like regulatory changes, uh, you know, um, other factors. Uh, a new exchange is welcome, but you know, like uh, speaking from like a, an investment banking perspective, um, a lot of the reason the the institutions are still sidelined is because. Um, the liquidities are fragmented. Um, there's just too many exchanges. And really, like, look at FX. There aren't that many exchanges. And it's, it's all about where is the primary exchange? Uh, where is, can, can the liquidity be sourced? So I, don't, I never understand why people get so excited ahead of a launch. You know, we really have to wait and see. But what we can do is we can learn and we can see what happened in FX, where OTC dominates. 99% of the volume is OTC, 1% is exchange. Why is that? How did that happen? That wasn't always the case 10 years ago. Um, but how, how did it evolve that way? You know, what led to the, the kind of the establishment of primary exchanges? And that's kind of like the, the ongoing evolution. So I, I don't think, uh, you know, like a CME, CBOE launch or, you know, these kind of launches keeps happening, but that's not really going to change it instantaneously. It's going to be a gradual process, I think. Okay, so um, from a regulatory standpoint, um, uh, what are the latest uh, signals? Uh, perhaps we'll start with Phil because you're in Japan and they have been ahead of the curve, so to say. <laughs> it's been interesting. Um, for anyone interested, I mean, I moved back to Japan in January last year. Uh, two weeks later, CoinCheck uh, happened, so it was uh, great timing. Um, and Ever since then, so when I first got to, uh, to Tokyo in the beginning of January, you know, but, uh, there's crypto commercials everywhere. Primetime TV is talking about crypto. Coincheck uh, hack happened. Everything stopped. There's, you know, there's no more marketing. There's, uh, you know, no more brokers uh, getting a licensing. The activity collapsed. Funny enough, the start of the bear market kind of coincided with the whole thing. Um, now it's changing. So Coincheck got the license. But what the FSA is doing is slightly different. And we've, others have mentioned this before. They're requiring you know, traditional finance expertise and professionals to come in. The KYC needs to be stepped up. The AML check needs to be stepped up. All of these things that you know, some of the participants were kind of overlooking needs to be you know, up to par with other financial, uh, traditional financial assets. And so the regulators are saying, okay, now you can come back in, but it's not the same as it was a year ago. They're saying you can come back in, but the quality needs to be up there with all other financial assets. That means a lot more headcounts, a lot more uh, you know, rules. And um, you know, it, it, it's, in a longer story, I mean, what's gonna happen is the margin is gonna compress and there's gonna be a, a huge business consequence where it's not going to be easy for anyone to just come in, I think. 
you're going to have to have a pretty big balance sheet. You're going to have to have a, a pretty big capital base because it's, it's becoming a professional asset class, which means that, you know, it's a whole lot more uh, difficult to operate. Tom? I, I started my career, and I've probably more than half of my career was in, in what I would call a real exchange, so recognized investment exchanges, so Life, the International Petroleum Exchange, um, and places like that, where an exchange is so much more than what is called an exchange in the crypto space. An exchange in the crypto space is, seems to be 90% a bit of a matching engine, um, whereas in an RIE, uh, there's so much more around that, and the matching part of it is the order book. The order book is a small part, and the whole or the whole market control around that market monitoring of the quality of the market is so much more than that. Um, and I think that's one reason why the um, the futures markets and those these professional players and the clearers have been a bit scared about it because they see it as an exchange, they see it as an exchange, but it doesn't operate like an exchange. Um, so the, that, the professionalization that we're seeing is going to move the exchanges more into what I would call a real exchange. And my prediction will always be that, has always been, I think it still will happen, is that the RIEs will end up taking this market. They will end up being the exchanges behind it because they have the infrastructure, the enormous infrastructure and size to be able to run a really a proper professional market. So maybe they'll use their own technology to do that or they'll buy some of the other exchanges when the prices get low enough. Um, and then you'll have a much smaller set of exchanges than the hundreds and hundreds that we have now that, that I, don't, I don't think are really exchanges. Wayne? Uh, yeah, look, I think uh, really good points made there. Um, from a reg perspective, uh, every day we see new announcements. We've got Singapore with the PSA, Hong Kong, SFC has uh, released their guidelines recently, Malaysia, Thailand, Philippines, the list goes on. So it's exciting, I think, for believers in the, in the asset class that it's not a question as to whether this is not going to be allowed at all. It's clearly here to stay, but then uh, there will be and needs to be proper rules that govern the behavior of the participants. So um, we're very uh, pleased to see that because I think uh, it will remove a lot of the bad actors that I think we referred to before. Um, and you know, on the point of infrastructure, the quality of exchange infrastructure, I actually think there's an opportunity for uh, in our space to even uh, provide an uplift to what has been traditionally delivered in uh, traditional exchanges, for example. So, you know, one of the areas uh, for us, you know, we've got, okay, um, the, the guys who built the original NASDAQ extreme matching engine, you know, we've, we've got the rights to that matching engine. So, okay, it's, it's the faster, newer version. Okay, that's one piece. But to your point, it's more. Uh, for coin purity, for example, like the opportunity to actually uh, inspect quarantine and deal with uh, uh, coins that come into your exchange before they actually reach your liquidity pool and to protect the sanctity of your liquidity pool is something you've never been able to do before. And you can't do it with fiat currency. That is something where, uh, as, a, as an ecosystem, we can actually help push the regulators to, uh, to impose those uh, uh, guidelines or restrictions, if you will, to actually produce even, uh, an even more robust environment with respect to AML, KYC, and KYB. So, um, there's, it, it's not only about, in my view, getting to the level of traditional exchanges. We can and have the ability to push beyond that. And, uh, and you know, certainly places like China uh, or, or many, many regulators and governments around the world will appreciate uh, that sort of infrastructure in my mind. Uh, Kerry? Yeah, so I think that when we are talking about the regulators, we need to understand what is the, what, what, what is the uh, purpose behind. Basically, is that we, as we can see, a lot of the exchanges nowadays in, uh, uh, in the growth basically is dealing with crypto to crypto. They don't deal with fiat, right? So that, uh, that is because I think that the, uh, the regulator will really concern the most. Like recently, we are working with uh, some of the Thai government like, like, uh, because they are issuing the, some of the crypto exchange license in Thailand and also for the ICO portals license. So we work very closely with them. Basically, their key concerns they are, they are looking after is that when the crypto exchange is going to happen in, uh, uh, happen in Thailand, when the crypto are uh, going to uh, exchange with the, peer, uh, the, the fiat uh, currency, like the Thai bucks, Okay, how does it actually is being regulated? Because like when we, uh, when we are talking about like dealing with the fiat, it's really, really important for the regulator to keep an eye on it. Yeah, so that's why I think that is the, 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 the regulations from, from the government point of view is about crypto to fiat portions. 
Okay, Jasper. I think I think this is a big topic. Uh, a lot of panelists already covered pretty much a lot, right? Uh, I think when we talk about regulations, it really depends on uh, geographically and vary from different products as well, right? We see Japan, US probably quite leading in terms of uh, the regulations. Hong Kong, Singapore now they said like they welcome, they want to do a sandbox. Some of the region they say like strictly banned, right? And we are also need to, to define like uh, regulation on what, right? Are we talking about crypto to crypto exchange? Are we talking about crypto CFD? Are we talking about ICO? We see the ICO seems like dying down. Now people talk about STO, right? So I think the regulations vary, depends on products, depends on, you know, geographically. Uh, so we have uh, one question from the audience, which uh, uh, I, I'm not sure how to interpret the Chinalysis reference, but uh, um, how much regulatory scrutiny have you see have you been seeing uh, on Chinalysis, and what are your thoughts on non fungibility of coins tainted by hacks or money laundering? It's a good question. Um, uh, I don't mind starting there. So. Uh, I think not only regulators but law enforcement agencies around the world are, actually don't really understand it yet. So uh, we're doing everything we can to, to, to work with, for example, the Hong Kong police or the SFC and so on around the region to try and help them understand uh, the capabilities and the technology that's there. Um, but as far as non-fungibility, I think they're a long way from that. The, the major concerns that we see from, uh, from the marketplace in addition to our, our own are from uh, traditional world of finance who want to enter this space, if it's bulge bracket banks or the like, the first thing that they're, um, they're really worried about, or particularly from the compliance perspective, is the sanctity of the coins that would enter their potential platform. And uh, if they are from the coin check hack or uh, some, some other hack, or if there have been, there's dark web links or whatever, that, that uh, is the foremost concern and should be, frankly. You know, um, we have the ability to, to be able to track and trace uh, through the beauty of blockchain, um, uh, in time, regulators and law enforcement will mandate that. In my mind, they're not, but they're not there yet. Uh, certainly not in this part of the world. Tom, do you have any perspective? It's not an area I have any expertise in. This, I'm afraid, so I can't. I think, like, uh, I agree that actually a lot of regulators they, that actually don't understand this, right? So I think the sandbox is actually good for you know, like, to to get the players to come in to actually explain to them what this is. Now, I think actually the uh, non-regulator do a lot more this kind of uh, training analysis on exchange, more than the regulators. Like I actually talked to someone uh, in Singapore, like uh, they attend the hackathon, right? One way they how try to value which exchange is actually the biggest, is that they did the chain analysis to see how much, you know, like a crypto they custodian for clients, right? So nowadays, you know, it's not regulator doing this, I would say. Phil? I mean, if, if governments and regulators are on top of this and, you know, at, at this kind of spearhead of like technology, I'm really proud to be paying my taxes. But the truth is, you know, a lot, and it's not just crypto. I mean, the, the world is changing so fast. I mean, you have pockets of people who wear Microsoft Excel is like, you know, wow, what is this, right? Versus guys programming C++. The regulators and governments are always, you know, a few steps back. So I think they're focused on what, what uh, kind of like what seems already wrong, which is like the KYC, the AML. These needs to be placed in first. And then they're going to start catching up to like chain analysis and everything else. So, um, you know, they're not focused on this. M most of them are not focused on this is the answer. Yeah, that, yeah that, that, that I think that I totally agree with at this stage. A lot of the regulators, they, they, they don't really focus on this, uh, I mean, like, um, the, the, the spec, because like everything is about crypto, and some of the regulators, they don't even recognize this crypto as, a, as one of the, 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 the fiat assets. So that's why I think that when we are moving forward, when the regulator really understand, you know, like really impose on the regulations on top of this uh, crypto uh, uh, industry, then we will talk about, you know, how are we going to, you know, like uh, better um, monitor and, 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 and how we're going to protect these uh, crypto assets. Uh, Tom, we have uh, another question which maybe you have uh, something to add on. Uh, actually, it's two questions which we can combine in one. And uh, Especially because we're very short on time. Yeah. Um, 
So what will be the, the motivations behind continuing uh, trading spot crypto after the CFD is permitted where there it, it is permitted? And how can the industry push back against the regulatory intention to ban CFDs? Well, if the, there's, there's sort of the essence of the second question is why, why did the regulators ban the crypto CFDs? Um, I think it's a knee-jerk knee reaction to, um, to the situation. They don't really understand it. They, you know, they, as, as we've been saying, it takes a long time for them to get up to speed. I mean, so um, they will have to learn about that. They will have to consult with the industry. And when they think it's a safer space, then they can go back in there. I mean, I was at a conference a couple of years ago when a regulator said, um, FX isn't really a speculative product. It's normally just used for margin. It's just like every single person there was speculative trading. I thought, right, okay, you really do need to learn a bit.